Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's always an honor to host you again on one of our intercommunity calls. I must confess that these calls are some of my favorite calls because we get to hear, we get an opportunity to hear the amazing work that you, our community members are doing. The internet has radically transformed our lives for the better and it owes its strength, resilience and success to its open architecture among other properties. This is why the Internet Society has created the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit. If we don't consider how our actions can harm the Internet, we risk breaking the underlying foundation that makes it work for everyone. During this one hour conversation, we'll hear from our community members who've had an active role in contributing to the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit. I hope you're as excited as I am to hear from our amazing panelists later on. But before we get started, I will remind us of our housekeeping rules. Uh, if you're joining these calls, uh, if you've joined these calls before, you're probably familiar with our housekeeping rules. But for the sake of new members, I'll just go through this quickly. Uh, if you have a question, feel free to type that question in the chat section. Remember to keep it short and concise. It would also be helpful if you could match your question with your first name and country. I'm also happy to announce that on this call, we do have translation. We have an amazing team of interpreters so that will be ready to interpret for you uh, for French and Spanish speakers. So please select the preferred language and the interpretation on your Zoom panel to get started. If you also have questions in French and Spanish, you can still ask those questions and they will be interpreted for you. And uh, this is another reminder to please keep your microphone on mute at all times to ensure that we have a fruitful discussion without interruption. And last but definitely not least, we'll be recording this call for purposes of our friends who are not able to join us today and the recording will be available to you after the call. And now uh, I'll go over to our engagement tool. We'll be using Slido as an engagement tool on this call. So right now I would request all of you to please go to Slido. If you can go to slido.com and enter the event code, hashtag ICOM2020. So if you can all go to slido.com enter the hashtag ICOM2020, and then we'll try out Slido right now. I'll load the first question on Slido. So you should all be able to see the question right now. And Ashlyn will share the results of that poll in a minute. participate. There you go. Thank you so much. Yeah, keep typing that in so that we get to know where everyone is joining us from. We'll give it another minute or two for people to participate. You can join Slido from your mobile phone or you can open a tab on your laptop and keep it open because we'll be engaging you throughout the uh, call using Slido. All right, I'll give it 30 more seconds. I see a lot of us, we have lots of people from the United States, the Netherlands, Kenya, Switzerland. Welcome to the call. Thank you so much for joining. All right, I will now run another poll. Make sure everyone is now ready to go with Slido. We have another active poll running right now.
Ashlyn, can we share the results of the second one? For some reason, I'm still seeing the results of the first poll. All right, thanks so much for your participation. And with that, I will hand you over to my colleague, Katie, to take you through the rest of the program. Katie, please take it away. Thank you very much, Evelyn, I really appreciate it. Um, do you want me to share my screen for the slides that I have? Or Ashlyn, do you have those? Ashlyn has them, she's got that covered. Great, thank you. Everyone, it's so nice to see you all. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time and your participation in this. So I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the internet way of networking and our internet impact assessment toolkit. And for those of you that I haven't met, my name is Katie Jordan. I'm a senior policy advisor at the Internet Society and I'm the project lead for this project. So I hope that you all are familiar with this project at this point. If not, I hope that you will become intimately familiar with it very soon. Um, but the internet way of networking essentially looks at how independent networks connect to one another, interoperate, and form the global internet. It basically looks at what takes us from those individual networks of networks and makes the capital I internet that we all rely on. Um, and it looks at the fundamental properties that have made it successful. And so when these properties, these critical aspects of the internet's foundation are under threat, so too are the opportunities that it offers, especially as the opportunities have grown during the time of COVID and we rely on it so much more. And so, you know, to boil it down, without this internet way of networking, without these critical properties that make up the internet's foundation, the internet can't fulfill its, its full potential. So we can go to the next slide. You know that the Internet Society's mission is to ensure that the internet is open and globally connected and secure and trustworthy. But the question is, why? Why are we looking at that version of the internet? And how are we really describing that internet? And to be true champions of the internet, the capital I network of networks, we needed to understand the properties that are so critical to its foundation and to really explain what's underneath it all. So having this uniform vision of the internet way of networking, of these foundational principles with these foundational properties of the internet will help us both as internet society staff and internet society community to analyze changes to the internet. That's everything from policy to technology, to look at the things that are both positively and negatively impacting the way that the internet is growing and expanding. So using this internet way of networking and the critical properties of the internet, we can analyze regulatory proposals, technology developments, we can track and understand the health and the evolution of the internet, we can express our unique focus and scope of concern, we can evaluate how all of these things actually impact a global network, and it can help us as one body, as one global community of advocates for the internet to express ourselves in a way that roots all of our work in the actual technical foundations of the internet, um, using this framework as a stable point for us. Because the internet society really believes that as the internet changes, there are some certain core properties that will not change. Um, and we can go to the next slide and we'll talk more about that. So as a part of that, if we're looking at the foundational properties of the internet and we're trying to figure out if policies and technologies are negatively or positively impacting it, we recognize that we needed some sort of a, an assessment. We needed one uniform way for all of us to take a policy or to take a technology development and say, okay, does this actually impact one of the five pr principles of the internet's foundation? And so that's how this toolkit was born. And it really should be a tool to help both those of us on this call, but also policymakers, technologists, and regular internet users to understand how decisions and trends could impact the internet. We can go to the next slide. So this will help all of us um, through a series of tools. And I hope that you've seen some of them already. Um, but there, this is, will include everything or does include everything from introductory videos and infographics to definitions of the critical properties, use cases to explain how this is already happening, infographics and frequently asked questions. And I think one way to think about this is 
similar to in a lot of countries, if you're going to build some sort of a new complex, a new apartment building, a new shopping mall, a grocery store, what have you, you have to do an environmental impact assessment. You just need to know what's going to be impacted by this new infrastructure. And in the same way, there should be this expectation that policymakers and technologists actually assess the impact of their actions on the internet's infrastructure. And that's what this tool is for. It should be something that keeps us all accountable and make sure that as we move forward, we aren't inadvertently harming some critical aspect of the internet especially as we see so many new pieces of regulation coming up all over the world um, that have very far-reaching unintended consequences. We can go to the next slide. So what are these critical properties of the internet way of networking? What are the things that actually make up its foundation? Next slide. Hopefully these are familiar to you from our policy development process. Um, but in consultation with our wider community, both of experts working on these things and our chapter members, our organizational members, and just interested advocates in this space, we came up with five things that are what we believe to be the core of the foundation of the internet. And we want to express to the importance of looking at it this way. It's not a list. It's not you know, you need to have the first one and then the second's less important, the third's a little less important, fourth, fifth, et cetera. But really these are the legs of a table. And you can think about it where all users of the internet everywhere are sitting around this table together. And the five pillars are like the legs of that table. And anytime a policymaker or a technologist starts to sort of shave away at the bottom of one of those legs to chip away at it anywhere in the world, the entire table becomes less steady for everyone sitting at it. And so that's why it's so important to protect all of these things everywhere, because the internet is global and borderless. And so the actions of policymakers in one place impact users everywhere else. Next slide. So we have a strong foundation of this toolkit, and you can see it on our website, which I'll put the link in the chat in just a minute. But this is just the beginning. This is still early, early days, and we need your help to make this better and stronger and more inclusive. Um, and we can do this in a few different ways. There are use cases that are high level trends, case studies that look at specific um, implementations or policies, and then additional documents like those analyses. So um, we can go to the next slide. And it's our hope that everyone will help us with these tools in the toolkit. Anyone with an understanding of the critical properties should be able to create a use case or a case study, and they should be able to follow our easy guide to evaluate policies and technologies, along with the people that are actually developing them. And it's our hope that the impact then will be that both our chapter members, our organizational members and our wider community can use this toolkit to stress test positions and strengthen their existing advocacy work, um, and it will provide a common narrative for everyone. So, and with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Carl. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon uh, to everyone. It's great to see so many people on this call and in so many different time zones. Um, together with Katie, I'm one of the project leads of this project. Uh, I'm located in, in Geneva, Switzerland. And I'm really excited about today's session. Um, where we will have three presentations from our community that have already um, taken the toolkit and put it to work, if you will. And this is really exciting for us, given the, the novelty of this project, uh, starting the initial work this year and, and launching it as recently as a few weeks ago. So we're really excited to see that this has already resonated with parts of our community and uh, that people have contributed to the formation of the toolkit and also putting it to use um, and the presentations today will, will range from uh, across the world. We will uh, go from China to Brazil to the United States. Uh, but I think importantly, it's, it's also diversity, not only in, in geography, but also in terms of perspectives of the toolkit and, and different uses of the toolkit. And that's something that we're really excited about, that this toolkit and the I1 concept, the Internet way of networking, can be put to use for both analysis, for education, and also for advocacy. Uh, before, before I introduce our, our first speakers, I just want to make a very practical note of, of how we will run this. So we will have a presentation from 
from uh, our speakers for about 10 minutes. Uh, and then we will have uh, questions to the, to the panelists, but we will only keep it to one or two questions before the next speaker. However, we are collecting the questions that you send in the chat separately, and we will bring it back into the conversation in the general Q&A. So don't worry if, if your question doesn't get raised immediately after the presentation, we'll pick it up in the Q&A or we'll try to pick it up in the Q&A. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce uh, our first speakers. And this is a relatively new organizational member with the Internet Society, uh, the Fuchs Institution, or Fushi Institution. I'm, I'm still working on the pronunciation. I'm hoping my colleagues can, can help me improve over time. Uh, and they're going to talk a little bit about how you can think about this work in, in analyzing change. And with us today, we have Oli Lu, who's the academic secretary of the Fuchs Institution, also a deputy secretary general of Guangzhou Cyber Forum, and has been engaged in international internet discussions for many years. Uh, we also have with us today, Dr. Wei Wang, who is the CTO of the Fuchs Institution. Uh, he's also the Secretary General of Digital Transformation and Development Committee of the Internet Society of China. Uh, he's a visiting professor at the Chinese Academy of Science and has been actively involved in ICANN for many years. Uh, and with that, I would like to hand it over to our, our first uh, presenters. I think it's Oli who starts. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so, uh, next page, please. <laughs> it's very, um, we're very happy to join uh, the ISOC community. Uh, we are relatively new to it. We just joined ISOC in May. Um, so I'll start with a little introduction about what, who we are. Um, we joined in um, ISOC in May and uh, we are new to the community. In June, we got connected with I1 project, and it's actually a very good timing. Then we got engaged in the PDP phase of I1 toolkit. Um, FUSI established, uh, was guided by many internet pioneers, including Vincer. And today's internet is much more completely complicated than decades ago. We're in an age of transformation. Technologies, social industry, structure, and global order are all changing. The problem is development not always leads us to a better world. It brings opportunities, but also challenges to the internet. We need development, but with concerns and respect to certain principles to persist the key values. So that's the meaning for internet way of networking. And in that sense, FUSI is pursuing has a lot of overlap with the I1 project. Our mission is to bridge digital divides and eliminate internet fragments by promoting connectivities. So that could explain our motivation to active, uh, actively engage in this program. Next slide, please. So how do we view the internet way of networking? First of all, it's definitely necessary to identify the critical property of the internet. Boil them down to five properties, which is a very reasonable numbers. In China, we say five as a number for elementary nature. It gives the I1 framework a stable and applicable structure. There are many actioners in the internet when, you, when we're using the internet and we are creating and empowering. From the I1 framework, we get the meaning of how the five properties work as a whole. When we look into each specific property, they're always related to a certain actioners behind, like common protocol provides accessibility and that's more for the end users. Open architectures enables interoperability for engineers. Distributed routing system reflects decentralization management for the carriers and operators. Common global identifier allows unification. Uh, that's ICANN's job. General, general purpose network gives internet neutrality is for the public to use and policymaker need to preserve it. Find out the actioner behind will help the properties connect to real situation and probably more applicable. 
it's also important for to give action a full picture of what make internet become the internet. That this is especially important for internet governance to have the properties clearly identified so people gain conscious and understanding about what must be avoided in policy making process and technology development. It's necessary to set rules for rules. Regulations should respect the nature. So I want, I, we think I want him did a great job to provide a solid identification on critical properties. I think it's also, we also think it's a good educational tools for the pu public to realize what need to appreciate instead of taking it for granted. Next slide, please. In the PDP phase, we provide some comments. Uh, first is to be stronger, to be a stronger source for to influence the policy making. It's necessary to tell what benefits with the five properties, but also needs to address the consequences if any of the property missing. So it's two sided. Policy makers need to know how serious the impacts are. So when they wait between factors, they could be more rational and uh, with the assessment tool. We suggest to incorporate storytelling about internet design principles from the very beginning. So give us uh, uh, some history about the internet design. And use cases need to be more sp specific and detailed with facts and numbers that will be helpful to get applications. And I will leave the how to improve parts to the questions. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, please go to the next slide. So we put some efforts in promoting the two case in Chinese community. The day at launched, we published the news on our website, WeChat platform and uh, other public media. And on August 7th, when ISOC published a statement on Clean Network, because I participate in I1 project, so I know where this statement come from. I know its value and importance. Immediately I translated it into Chinese and with a, uh, I put a short remark on top. It was published on Fuxi's website and soon got forwarded, republished everywhere. Over 200,000 page views accumulatedly. So my tips in translating, doing the translation work is to use I1 language and be neutral but firm um, and stand for internet's core foundation. Next slide, please. We also see some op opportunities for, uh, please go to the next slide. Uh, next slide, sorry. We also see some opportunities for, uh, future for the further engagement and applications. So my colleague Wang Wei is working on organizing an internet fundamental technology seminar. Uh, so previous slide, uh, the one previous slide. Uh, so the seminar will be held on the November 18th. Uh, we would like to invite uh, the I1 team to participate and bring experts and insights about the two kids. We will keep studying and analyzing how the toolkit could apply to cases from technology, policy, and culture perspectives. And for education, besides le uh, lectures and programs, we think it might be very interesting to develop some interactive apps for the public. So now Wei will give his flash ideas about more case studies. So please, one way you can to your turn. Thanks, Holly. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Carl, I I think uh, I have my I, I probably have only three or four minutes, so I I will make a quick. The first slide, uh, next one, please. Yes, this one. This one. This slide is about the uh, systematically regulated networking architecture in China. I mean. Uh, China is a kind of a, you know, different from the rest of the world uh, regarding the internet architecture. But we have to uh, be aware of the nature behind that kind of governance model. 
Uh, let's look back to 1994 when China get connected to the uh, NSF net for the first time and become, became the 77 uh, country get, uh, connected to the internet. After that, the three biggest national wide ISP, China Telecom, China Mobile, and China Unicom, the three state owned ISP has cross border links and have the license of conducting cross border transi uh, transition. Was was were established. Of course, there are some other uh, smaller national wide ISPs and more local network accessing service providers, but only the three ones have the ability of BGP broadcasting or forwarding the BGP routing to the internet international peers. So basically, the architecture in China is not like the like a mesh. It's not a mesh, but more like multiple stars. Though the uh, architecture is quite different from the other part of the internet, the Chinese internet development, uh, you know, goes pretty well. It developed at a rapid speed in the past 20, 20 years. And as you can see that the, the penetration, the, the, the netizen, uh, netizenship number, and uh, the you know, biggest uh, companies we provided to the world, uh, the, the, the number are pretty good. So it may be not easy to tell whether the existing regulatory rules or governance model will harm the Chinese internet in the long run. At least so far, the digital economy in China goes well. Uh, I have to tell that uh, we, when we're speaking about the uh, you know censorship or data sovereignty in China, it's not about ideology. It's more about Chinese culture or the history. For the past 2000 years, China has been a centralized empire. And uh, even at the age of discovery, when Europe explored the world, the China, the Chinese dynasties, the Ming Dynasty and Qing Dynasty enforced a very strict maritime prohibition policy, you know, as a national policy. So the uh, the civil the 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 Chinese local civil person civil participation in import and export is strictly prohibited but the, the but the the, the uh, 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 royal merchants are, are allowed to trade with the foreigners so it is a kind of a history or culture tradition in in china so it is really hard to per, to persuade the local governors, the officers or researchers or the common people to accept the five principles we generated. We need time and we need patience to talk with them, talk with them to communicate, to commute, communi communicate with the local community. And for some reason, it is very pity that the most Chinese community are kept out of the ISOC for some reason. And uh, this is very lucky for Fuxi institution that we Sub, submit uh, the application and get, get accepted by the ISOC in this May. So we will do our best to, to, to improve this kind of communication. Next one, please. Yeah, that's why. So I suppose I realized that the ISOC published its reports of an, uh, analysis on Huawei's new IP and the Chinese data localization uh, in this report. And I suppose we'll, there will be more uh, cases that deserve studies, case studies, like RPKI, which uh, you know China China's government are kind of uh, afraid of the RPKI will bring five new IP routes instead of the DNS route. So there's an alternative options that there may be some local third party uh, trust anchor for IP addresses. And uh, in the next uh, year, maybe in 2021 or 2020, I can will generate the, the next round of new GTLD. So lots of local cities will probably will submit the application for the geo names. So it, it probably will be a good case study. And uh, the DOI, uh, China is trying to uh, you know, import a DOI technology into its uh, uh, into the uh, internet of industry. They were probably, they're interested in generating a new identifier using the DOI 
instead of using the domain name. Uh, so these are all good case studies. So Fushi institution are willing to communicate with Huawei and some local ISPs on these case studies to see if we, we can, you know, generate this kind of local case studies and provide the local opinion to ISOC. The next one. Okay, it's the last one. Last one is about the tuber. Uh, it, I, I personally think it will be a very interesting case study. In the last week, a local Chinese uh, cybersecurity company has uh, published its, 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 uh, its services, a new app, its name is Tuber, which will provide the local citizen to access Google, Facebook, Twitter without, you know, without using any VPN directly across the uh, great firewall, but just after one day, it disappears. But I suppose this kind of apps probably will become a common tools for the Chinese person or for some other in some other countries. So it is a very interesting case study because this kind of apps do does not violate any one of the five principle, but it you know it's just a, a kind of a, a, a tunnel a, a, a tour on the application level. So what? So what? Uh, I, I was wondering how we can leverage or evaluate this kind of uh, uh, apps if this if this is just an application uh, tools and it, its operation will not violate any one of our principles. So I suppose it probably will be a trend. And I think this case deserves more investigation. Okay, thank you. That is my part. Thank you very much, Wei and Oli. Super interesting presentation. I see we have a lot of requests for, for people wanting you to share the presentation afterwards. Uh, I find it very interesting to hear also about the, the, the cultural background that might play into understanding the Chinese internet and, and how uh, even historical issues going back to, to the dynasties um, can be a factor in explaining this. Super interesting. I had a, a standard question that I will ask all panelists, and I think Oli touched upon this uh, briefly about suggested improvements to the toolkit. I think you brought up a super interesting case here at the end way, and, and those are the types of things that we're hoping to learn about and get inspiration from and have others help progress the thinking on. Uh, would, you, would you care to expand a little bit uh, also on, on other issues that you see with a toolkit that can be improved going forward and that Perhaps other community members can also help develop. Um, so I'll start. So I do prepared one comments for the improvement, and I think uh, between the uh, the I one is promoting a ideal internet. So so the the internet way of networking is a ideal internet that we could use for to to promote more innovation and uh, creativity. So, but it's necessary to have a, to create a bridge between the ideal internet and the social, social reality. So mm, we, we should not avoid to talking about this, the reality we have right now. So if there's a bridge between that will be helpful to help the case, um, uh, especially for the case studies, if when we do the case study, if we can analyze both the technical and social natures of the internet and concern, concern about uh, both technical and social perspectives, that would be helpful to make the two case uh, apply to the real situation to create a bridge. And I think the, the case we, uh, we raised but uh, in the waste presentation, he mentioned about the tuber. We think maybe it's interesting to study about the the, the application. Maybe it's can it can be a bridge. So way maybe you can ex explain more about this. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, before I joined Fushi Institution, I worked in Google uh, for a few years. Um, working on Google Cloud, trying to uh, you know improve its engagement in China. 
So I talked with a lot of Googlers and uh, about the uh, how to bridge the Chinese network and the global network. Uh, we talked about uh, we, we talk about a lot about uh, technology, about policy, as well as the culture, <laughs> as I explained. So I think Tuber will, uh, might be a, it, be a trend. It, it might be the future because the uh, uh, willing, willingness or not, the internet is, fragment, is fragmented. I mean, we are all locked inside our cell phone. So we more and more netizenships, uh, they will be not aware of the existence of the uh, you know, uh, internet infrastructure. What, is, what they can see is just the mobile phone, all the apps of the platform, of the virtual machine. So if the apps do not provide the access channel to Google or to Facebook, they might be not be aware of the existing of this kind of services. That is what I observe from the young generation in China. So if the tuber will, you know, it, uh, apparently the tuber get improvements from the government to set up this kind of uh, uh, access channel to Facebook and Google. So at one hand, it is very helpful, right? It, it, it helps to, 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 to build the, uh, uh, to help the uh, local people to see the world. But at the other hand, there are some embedded censorship me mechanism in this kind of application. So what kind of, uh, 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 what can we evaluate this kind of uh, uh, application? It is good or bad, or it's not a simple question about good or bad. It provides value, but at the same time, it helps the censorship of the government uh, which is which make it legal in China inside of the in in a, in, in a sovereignty, uh, uh, but uh, maybe in some other countries from other from the perspective of other communities, it might be not a good application. But I think so. So my my I have no answer for this kind of question. But I just think it is very very valuable case for the you know for the community to study. Thank you very much, Wei, and, and thank you both very much for the presentations again. It was really interesting, and I hope maybe we can follow up and, and discuss further work on this. Um, we will be moving Carl, to- is it a, it, Since we, we're on the topic of suggested improvements, I was thinking just of maybe adding on here and then taking off a minute or two later, uh, just I think to kind of build on that, or is that okay? Or do you wanna hold that for later? Uh, I think we need to hold it for later just so that we um, get a chance to go through the presentations, but it would be great if you wanted to connect back to, to what Wei was discussing now as well. Uh, sure. Make sure that we're, we're getting through the, to the presentations as well. Okay. Um, so while I'm introducing the next, uh, next speakers, I just want to flag that we do have a poll in the background as well in Slido, if you want to go in and have a look. Um, but we will now be moving into the next presentation and we will be jumping over to Brazil uh, where we will have a presentation from uh, our Brazilian chapter uh, represented by Professor Flavio Wagner, who is the president of the Brazil chapter. Flavio is a professor of computer science and engineering at the Federal University of uh, Rio Grande do Sul in Porto Alegre. Uh, he will also be joined today by Professor Alexandre Pacheco da Silva, and they will talk a little bit about the, both the, the work of the Brazilian chapter in feeding input to the toolkit, and also a collaboration that they have between the Brazilian chapter and the university in Brazil. So I'll hand over to Fabio. So uh, thank you very much, Carl. Thank you for inviting us uh, to uh, this uh, contribution to this uh, intercommunity event. So uh, the idea here is to report on two different initiatives uh, the Brazilian chapter of the Internet Society had with regard to the uh, Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit and the Internet Way of Networking Critical Properties. So uh, next slide, please. So the first uh, uh, initiative the, the chapter had, it's because of the relevance of the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit we decided to prepare a, a very solid contribution from the chapter itself to the policy development process, to the open consultation. 
uh, uh, from the Internet Society uh, regarding uh, the, the, the toolkit. So, uh, as you may know, uh, the official la language in, in Brazil is Portuguese. So we had to, in very short time, translate uh, more relevant documents, uh, mainly the introduction to the toolkit and the critical properties to Portuguese so that uh, it could be more widely distributed and, and uh, uh, to our members in Brazil and to our local community. We then uh, organized a webinar on the IUN uh, toolkit uh, where uh, the webinar was open to all members, of course, and we invited panelists with very diverse backgrounds to the discussion on the toolkit. We also, in parallel, uh, made consultation with expert members uh, discussing the more technical aspects of the critical properties. We then, uh, in a collective effort, prepared the draft of a contribution to the PDP uh, we also consulted with selected members for reviewing the draft with the, the experts, experts that were present at the webinar so that we could manage to submit a contribution uh, to the PDP on time, uh, discussing uh, the critical properties themselves, also the structure of the toolkit, and also some contribution about the way the PDP was uh, developed. And I would say that we we managed to, to, to prepare a solid contribution. And uh, I would uh, ask all other chapters to also try to engage with their members in the follow-up uh, to the toolkit. So we now have a very solid document, a set of documents in, in the toolkit. We have the use cases. Uh, it is open to the community to propose and, and develop new use cases, new case studies. And I think the chapters can uh, be very important in this effort, in this collective effort from the Internet Society, that the chapter uh, officials in, in all countries try to engage their members and, and prepare documents in collective efforts. So next slide, please. So the second initiative was uh, to uh, offer an online open course on the internet way of networking and its technical policy and regulation aspects. And of course, uh, uh, strongly uh, adapting the content to the Brazilian reality. And we developed a partnership with the uh, Getulio Vargas Foundation, a very important academic institution in Brazil. So next slide, please. So we then together uh, proposed a 32 hour free online course based on the internet way of networking. So on the, the critical properties on the use cases and uh, discussing this toolkit from a Brazilian perspective. So this uh, is then a partnership uh, between uh, the, the chapter and the Getulio Vargas Foundation. The funding was uh, partially uh, given by a small grant from the ISOC Foundation. So we proposed this project in the context of this uh, call for small grants and also uh, mainly in-kind support from the Getulio Vargas Foundation. So it's professors and it's administrative and technical uh, staff uh, for uh, supporting the course. And the target audience was uh, both graduate students from the FGV Law School but also ISOC members from all the country and the community at large. So this course started uh, two weeks ago, today in the evening in Brazil, we will be having our third meeting with our uh, uh, students and, and community that's participating in the course. So now I will hand over uh, to uh, Professor Alexandre Pacheco da Silva from, from FGV, which is the main responsible for uh, the development of the course. So please, Alexandre, it's up to you. Thank next. you very much, Flavio. Uh, thanks. Uh, if you can move for the next slide, perfect. So let me, inc let me introduce my myself. Uh, I'm Alexandre Pacheco da Silva, and I'm a law professor at Sao Paulo Law School of Getúlio Vargas Foundation. And uh, I coordinate alongside uh, with Professor Marina Pfefferbaum, the Center for Education and Research on Innovation, uh, research unit 
uh, at Sao Paulo Law School dedicated to build projects that can foster discussions on how technology and innovation processes impact society and what should uh, be an adequate response of the legal system that uh, we can deal with uh, locating the problems that uh, we can see on the internet at the Brazilian context. Uh, that's why uh, this online course is strategic for uh, the Sao Paulo Law School and for uh, the research center that uh, Professor Marina and I coordinate. And when we look about the topics that we selected uh, for the course, uh, we have we uh, have a, a duty to fulfill the vision of the research center. We develop projects on different topics and with different sponsors. Uh, for example, projects uh, in intermediary liability, uh, encryption uh, in data security, uh, disinformation, hate speech so on and so forth. And when we think about these uh, research projects, we have a challenge that is, how can we translate uh, things that we discuss uh, in an academic perspective into uh, a, a broader uh, community, into uh, terms that everyone could engage on and everyone could have an opinion on. So uh, this specific course uh, helped us to translate the discussions that we presented in our reports paper into an open discussion during classes using, for example, the case studies that uh, uh, this project, this Internet Society project uh, offer us to at least discuss in some level uh, and to deal with different perspectives that in our view and for the first two classes, we learn a lot from them. So can you uh, move to the next slide, please? Thank you. So for, and I would say that for the first time uh, in our institution, uh, we were able to offer a course that is not exclusive conducted by lawyers and legal scholars. We had courses with people from economics and courses with people from uh, business school, but we did not have uh, uh, opportunity, for example, to offer a course with uh, people from uh, so many different areas as we are trying to do uh, with this course. And we had the opportunity to have uh, in our course several experts from different fields of knowledge discussing topics in a broader perspective. We also had the opportunity to think about how could we innovate in terms of uh, an online course, because we, we uh, only had a few uh, uh, online courses in the past. And after uh, the scenario of the, the uh, pandemic, we uh, actually needed to uh, reflect. We actually needed to think hard on how can we innovate in this uh, uh, topic in online courses. And, we decided that uh, a good strategy is to have pre-recorded uh, interviews with experts from the topic of the class, uh, uh, which in our view work it as uh, a mandatory preparation for uh, the students. And we mix that uh, with lectures and open discussions during the classes. Uh, can you move for the next slide, please? Thank you. So uh, in terms of the students, uh, the online course also helped us to expand and diversify the profile of the students that we have in our courses at Sao Paulo Law School. Usually restricted to law students, lawyers, maybe some students from the business school uh, and uh, some public officials in different areas, uh, mainly concentrated in Sao Paulo and near cities. This online course allow us to expand uh, to other states and have people from different backgrounds highlighting uh, the participation of journalists, uh, computer scientists, uh, political scientists, among others. We had 179 candidates. We uh, selected 36 uh, students from different states balanced in terms of gender, race, and age. 
We also added 14 undergrad students that uh, are involved in projects that, uh, in law and uh, technology field, not only uh, in internet governance, but we uh, actually uh, uh, selected students with different uh, other fields uh, that we can elaborate on that. Uh, we are betting that those 14 students uh, represent a new generation of lawyers interested in the relationship between law and technology and with a uh, uh, trust to uh, know technical aspect and other subjects that we consider important in this uh, topic. And to sum up my speech, uh, this is a very important project and I uh, thank everyone involved uh, for this opportunity. Uh, uh, especially uh, because for the Center for Education and Research uh, in Innovation and for Sao Paulo Law School, it is an, a project that can uh, 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 allow us to grow on which kind of uh, course we are willing to offer for not only our students, but a broader community. And it helped us to expand the contribution that we expected to provide to public debate about internet governance and its main challenge, especially how can we explain and discuss the five uh, main uh, critical properties of the, the internet. And it, and it is also strategic for us because it strengthens our position as a research center in Brazil. And uh, this partnership is essential to provide us the opportunity and the means to expand the number of stakeholders that we can uh, uh, be in touch with. And therefore, uh, to end up my uh, speech here, I thank Professor Flavio Wagner, Diego Canabarro, and Paula Cortiel for the involvement and contribution. This course, thank you very much for the next slide. I forgot it, uh, uh, to, to ask. Uh, uh, I think not only uh, Professor Flavio Wagner, Diego Canabarro, pa Paula Cor and Paula Cortiel uh, for the involvement and contribution, but uh, I need to give a special thanks for Ana Paula Camelo, the FGV project leader, for this initiative because we uh, managed to gather a lot of people from uh, different places, places, different perspectives to uh, actually try to create a plural uh, discussion regarding those topics. And uh, that's why I thank also the Internet Society for giving us this opportunity because allow us to expand what we do at uh, Sao Paulo Law School. So that's why I thank and I thank the institution and I thank the people uh, involved. Uh, and I wish uh, everyone have a great event uh, throughout uh, this morning, afternoon or uh, evening that we are uh, having here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Super interesting and encouraging presentation and the interest that have been in the course. Um, we're running a little bit over time. I, it, it's, it's frustrating because I think each one of these presentations deserves a, a full session in their own and there's a lot of things to discuss for each one of them. Um, I, I want to move along just in the, in the agenda to allow for our next speaker to, to present as well. Um, I am hoping that people can stay over a little bit and because we will run over the hour um, potentially. So it would be great if you could stay over and, and uh, we can have the follow-up discussions as well and potential Q and A's for, for the participants. Uh, but I'll move directly to, to our uh, next speaker, who is uh, Dustin Loop, who's the executive director of uh, the Internet Society chapter in uh, Washington, D.C. who will talk a little bit about the, the work that they've done and how they've used the, the toolkit in their advocacy. Thanks, Carl. And I had an hour long lecture planned, but I'll try to keep it to three minutes instead um, and hopefully have a little bit of extra time for Q&A. So there's an excerpt up on the screen here from a statement that we made. Um, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but I just want to, you know, commend the work that the Internet Society has done in pulling this together. I think that this Internet way of networking project really gets to the heart of why we do the work we do at ISOC DC. I don't want to speak for everyone, but, um, you know, the critical properties of the internet's foundation are kind of the closest thing that we have to a constitution 
And uh, at ISOC DC, we like to say that we're against breaking the internet. And this helps us articulate exactly what that means and turn it into something tangible. And a good example of that came with the executive order by President Trump on TikTok and WeChat with the subsequent ban that was announced by the Department of Commerce, um, which I think many of us would agree is a major threat to break the internet, um, which as I stated, we're against. So, um, you know, there's, there's much more that we included in this statement about the issues that we had with it. Um, but I, I just pulled out this last paragraph in which we pointed people to look at and use the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit as an important resource for analyzing the impact of policy proposals and decisions like this on the Internet's infrastructure. Um, we didn't go in depth to take the announcement and run it through the five questions to produce a, a case study. Um, but the issues that we highlighted were very much in line with the spirit in those questions. Um, and this, I think, gets to one of the improvements that uh, I wanted to mention with the toolkit is kind of thinking about how we can repackage all of the great work that's been done in there in a way that can be communicated to the decision makers that we are trying to influence. And um, the five questions are great. I think they're on point, but how do we take those five questions and uh, produce a case study that uh, doesn't require uh, too much more, more reading? How can we kind of put that all in one package? Um, and I suspect that we're going to get very proficient at this. Um, you know, this, this is a trend that's happening across the world. And um, in the US, there's an increasing amount of government action against tech companies that's going to impact the critical properties of the internet's foundation. Um, and that's regardless of how our election turns out. Um, I think regardless of who's in power, the tech companies and the internet are going to be in the, the crosshairs and we need to be very proficient at being able to help them realize uh, what their decisions mean for the internet's infrastructure. Unfortunately, I think we're also dealing with issues in which the consequences are not necessarily unintended. So that's another front that we have to engage on. Um, but uh, and and you know we look forward to using this toolkit and encouraging others both in within the internet society and uh, outside of it to use this as they are considering their actions. Um, I don't have a lot more. I know that we're at time. I mean, I think I, the one thing that I wanted to touch on earlier when I chimed in was just that I I think that's an important point in creating a bridge between the ideal reality and the social reality. Um, and it got me thinking about um, the way that the toolkits currently framed is how does a proposed law decision or trend potentially harm the internet? Well, what about the other way around? How, how does that proposed law or decision or trend potentially benefit or strengthen the foundation of the internet? And how can we use that as champions for the internet to to guide our work um, in a positive way and and to articulate the value of the work that we're doing within our chapter and to the internet society and, and just the broader community. Um, so I'll end there. I, I'm happy to stick around for a discussion. Um, I know we're at time, so I don't I don't want to go over with any official remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Dustin. And and uh, just to flag, as we mentioned before Dustin's presentation, we, we will be running a little bit over. If you're available to stay, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, if there are follow-up questions and, and further discussions about this work. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat right now for the for the speakers, but meanwhile, I wanted to sort of revert back to, to Flavio and Alexander's presentation and then go to Dustin to 
um, have them introduce perhaps suggested improvements to the toolkit that they've seen. And I know that we didn't get to that in the Brazil presentation. Uh, so let's start there. And if there are suggestions of, of how this can be improved, and I encourage others on the on the call as well uh, that are not presenters to also jump in into the discussions and, and raise your hand in the chat if you wanna if you wanna raise something. Sorry, yeah. over to you, Fabio. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Carl. So if I may, just uh, of course uh, we had a more uh, uh, detailed contribution that we submitted to the PDP. But anyway, if I uh, just uh, pick one or two uh, main points of this contribution. One of them is uh, regarding the, the critical properties themselves. So uh, although we are very happy uh, about the, the, the five critical properties that we have, uh, we suggested that maybe uh, two uh, or one uh, main characteristic of the, the internet is not entirely directly reflected by the, the, the five properties, which is that uh, the internet uh, implements end-to-end -end communication and the intelligence is mostly pushed to the edges of the, of the network. So this, is, this characteristic is neither explicitly expressed by the five critical properties that have been defined or nor automatically derived from them. So this is something that we thought it could be better expressed by, by the properties, maybe together with one of, one of the properties or as an additional property. On the toolkit itself, uh, uh, we think that uh, for, for, for most internet users and policymakers, which are not technologists, they are not so much interested in uh, architectural issues. They do not perceive those issues they really th uh, think mostly of the impact uh, on other properties that are really perceived by them, such as resiliency, security, trustworthiness, reliability, neutrality, even neutrality and privacy and so on. So things that are really perceived by the final users and that uh, uh, encourage policymakers uh, to make movements regarding the regulation of the internet in their uh, countries or regions. So. Uh, I think that uh, the assessment of the impact of the five critical properties on those other properties that are really perceived by the users could be something interesting that could be added uh, to the toolkit as an additional uh, document. So these are two of the contributions uh, we gave in our uh, uh, during the PDP. Thanks, Flavio. And I, I fully understand what you mean with the end-to-end -end principle not being explicitly expressed in the toolkit. I think we, it's sort of implicit in there in some of the citations we have there, for example. But it's a good comment that, because it's, uh, it's something that is a recognizable concept for many people as well, uh, the end-to-end -end principle about keeping the intelligence at the networks. On your, on your second comment, and I think this might be a good bridge over to what um, both Oli and, and Dustin was uh, was mentioning about the impact on other properties that are important in the internet. That in some in some instances you could articulate them as social dimensions of the internet. For example, if it's a trustworthy nature of it or other aspects of it. Uh, so I wanted to go over to to Dustin to sort of continue on to that discussion about how could we expand this to be able to capture those additional properties or the social link that, that you and, and Oli had discussed. I also see we have a few questions coming up in the chat, so we'll try to tease them in as we go along in these discussions. Yeah, I'm happy to elaborate on that a little bit. Um, you know, part, part of that I just kind of have evolved in my thinking on during this call, so um, We'll look forward to flushing that out beyond this discussion as well. Um, but I think that in creating that that bridge that was discussed, um, it in terms of the chapter perspective, I think it creates an important bridge between the the chapters and the Internet Society organization as well, um, and does so in a way that helps create that bridge between the ideal and the social realities of the internet that were kind of articulated earlier. And, and I say that because as, as chapters, our focus is often on more locally relevant issues that sometimes do and sometimes don't fit into the 
internet society's project structure, which for the record, I think is great. And the work that's being done is fantastic. Um, there's not a lot of, that being said, there's not a lot of opportunity for our members to, I guess, meaningfully contribute to time security, right? Um, and I think that this internet way of networking is a good way to take the focus on the issues that we care about, whether they be economic focused, trade focused, focused on content moderation or any of these things and uh, articulate why the work that we are doing is important for these fundamental principles of the internet and show why it has a place within the internet society. And in doing so, we can also communicate to others who don't maybe understand all of the work of the internet society, why these are relevant issues for us. And then the chapters uh, can ultimately create this pipeline where we are helping create that bridge by providing local expertise on these different issues that if we ignore due to the lack of an inherent impact on the internet, I believe it will have an ultimately be harmful for the principles within the internet way of networking because um, the people that care about all of all of these issues aren't going to care about the infrastructure if it's impacting them negatively. Um, you know, we, the, the rhetoric is going to be powerful. There are some formidable forces kind of focused on regulating the internet. And like I mentioned earlier, not necessarily with unintended consequences, but intended ones. And so I think that, um, using it in the positive direction. So like, how is our work contributing to, you know, strengthening the foundation of the internet could lead to, to building that bridge. And I'd be interested to, to hear from Ollie and Wei about uh, their thoughts on that as well. I'll let Ollie and Wei jump in straight away here. Yeah. Thanks for uh, Dustin. I really like your thoughts and uh, I think you can understand part of what I mean. And I, I, I do agree with yours. Um, I think this toolkit can be a very good base ground. Um, it's, uh, it's using a, actually it's using a technical language. It's, a, it's come from the technical architecture of internet and is using the engineering language. And I think maybe even despite of some conflict we have um, towards the internet, uh, it's still uh, the engineering itself, engineering language itself is already a bridge. And I think it will be very interesting to see when the, this took it published to the community, launched to the communities, um, so people from different backgrounds, from different countries, different social situations can start to apply to it uh, with case studies and share to the community. I think there might be some way that we can share how, how we use it as a tool to view, to measure some current uh, situation, some phenomenon, um, and share it, publish it, maybe maybe create a dashboard, so we can share our experience and the, our analyzations. Um, that would be helpful for the community to establish a better use case. Wei, do you have something to refer? Wait, yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Oli. And, and just to um, touch upon what you and Dustin was mentioning in, in terms of sort of further use cases, and I think importantly, positive cases that can illustrate how something might strengthen and work in favor 
of the critical properties and, and the I1 model and this toolkit is something that we're super interested in going forward in identifying those cases because it shouldn't just be a lens of, of looking at bad stuff. It should be able to have a positive outlook as well and how we're strengthening things. And it's, it's, it's really encouraging to hear that, that this is being thought about and we really encourage people that have ideas for what they could look like, those use cases or those cases to submit ideas. And as you mentioned, Oli, uh, the end point goal here is that we would have community generated content around this that encompasses the, the toolkit that does these analyses. Um, I see we have, we have a question from uh, Richard Hill in the chat, which is uh, about a, a comment he made. And Richard, I will ask you to jump in and present that question in, in just a minute. Uh, and I'll ask you to be relatively short, but before we go to Richard, I just wanted to go to Alexandra to ask about this bridge between the, the toolkit and the, and the social side and, and how you've experienced that in the, in the coursework that you guys have been working with and, and with the students. Thank you for the question, Carl. Uh, it's a, a huge challenge because if we want a classroom full of people with different backgrounds, we need to, to deal with a common language that we can actually address topics. Uh, and I agree uh, fully with Professor Flavio when he mentioned that uh, people perceive uh, things regarding the internet and regarding topics uh, on the internet differently. And you need to actually establish a common ground to start to discuss what is the problem and what should we do with the problem if we have a problem like that. For example, we have a, a lot of discussions regarding security, uh, privacy and encryption. When we think about those topics, we need to establish a common ground because people start to uh, talk about those topics, but uh, people perceive uh, the things in a technical perspective, in a legal perspective, and in other uh, uh, topics in a different manner. So. The main challenge is how to establish in the classroom this common ground. And one thing that uh, we bet on, it is to start with an interview, with an expert interview. Uh, and afterwards, uh, we will present uh, a, a brief uh, sum up of the, the topic in a technical perspective. And we will try to translate the terms in different areas and see if people are getting where what we are trying to uh, explain and uh, open to a discussion that people can engage in the topic and can contribute uh, creating links between uh, uh, those ideas and their ideas uh, and that's the challenge because we see that for the first two classes in my view we uh, receive a very good feedback but we are hoping that we, we can get the same result with uh, the uh, further topics. But that's the, the challenge for an online course. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Um, I wanted to go to, to, to Richard with your question that I know was directed to all of the panelists. And I, I will ask you to, I think you can unmute yourself and ask the question directly and, and sort of sum up. Uh, the comments that you had and the question that you had to the panelists. I'll ask you to keep it very short just so that we can get to other questions in the chat as well. Uh, Richard? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Carl. Uh, you, you've heard this many times, so you know exactly what it's about. I posted several comments in the chat, which I think are all uh, questions. Uh, would, would you agree with me? I'll just focus on one, and it's the one I call be careful not to do the category error. So, uh, for example, Dustin, I don't think you can criticize the ban on TikTok on the basis of the critical properties. I agree the ban on TikTok is nonsense and it's evil and it shouldn't be there. But let me give an example. If an app is being used to disseminate, mostly used to disseminate child abuse material, then surely it should be banned. And that has nothing to do with critical properties. So we have to be careful. You know, The fact that if something is technically possible does not mean that we want it. The example I always use is cars can go at 200 kilometers an hour but we still have speed limits. So we have to be careful about that. No, I do agree that when you have a policy, you should try to figure out if it's gonna have an unwanted effect on the infrastructure. And I would agree with you, Dustin, you should also look if it has an intended effect on the infrastructure and then criticize that intended effect, which I agree with you was the case with TikTok. It was not unintended, it was intended and we should criticize the intent also. Thanks Carl for giving me uh, a couple of minutes. 
Uh, Dustin, I don't know if you want to jump in and respond to that, right? Yeah, what was the specific question? I mean, thank you for your comments, but um, what was the, how would you frame the particular question in that? Oh, well, would you agree with my analysis? Okay. Um, to an extent, I mean, I think that um, blocking, because it's not, it's not just TikTok, right? So if we put aside the controversy around TikTok and whether or not uh, you agree with the problems, just setting that aside and looking at something like uh, WeChat, which um, I don't think you could make any claims was used primarily for child abuse materials um, that's used by, you know, billions of users as their fundamental way to communicate with people. Um, placing bans of that magnitude on services that perform so many functions, I think is a little bit different than blocking an individual site that's providing child abuse material. Um, and I think that the impacts of kind of implementing a ban like that likely has more impact than the, you know, the kind of one-off bans of particular sites and things like that. Thanks, Dustin. And and I think I, one of the messages that we're trying to get with a toolkit is, and I think this is a little bit to Richard's point, that we, we might want to be addressing things on the internet and you know, setting aside this particular case, but there are things that need to be addressed on the internet. But I think what, what Dustin is raising is important that the way that you go about doing that will have more or less implications for the networking model, right? And, and in this particular case, what we saw from the internet society's perspective was how it was mandating the behavior of networks that had repercussions for other networks, right? And for those services. So it, it's not always about the, the outcome and the intent, it's, it's how you go about enforcing those policies that could be the issue. Um, with that, I wanted to, I know that we only have a few minutes left and I see a few um, comments and questions in the chat that I think are, are quite interesting. And one of them, I think it's directed to all of the all panelists, but I'll see if someone wants to jump in and take it. Um, it's from uh, Zhao Arinevi Susu and asking about how does the toolkit strengthen individual inclusion into the internet and its ecosystem and related aspects? Do you see how the, do you see a link for the sort of individual's role in the internet when, when you think about the toolkit? So if I may, uh, yeah, I would say yeah, it's not a direct connection, but of course it is very important for, for inclusion that we have an open internet. So this is some basic uh, uh, asset so that uh, more uh, networks from all over the, the world connect easily to the internet, that uh, we do not need some centralized permission to do that that we also can offer new services uh, that are uh, available for the citizens around the world. So these things are very important for inclusion, that we have an open internet for uh, uh, offering information uh, regarding different cultures, different uh, societies, and, and so on. So the, the openness of the internet is an essential property regarding inclusion of people and, and communities. So it's uh, something that I would say derive from, from the properties uh, for sure. Thank you, Flavio. Uh, we, we had another set of questions also, and I'll actually summarize them into the, the question about cybersecurity and, and, and ask the panelists if, if someone wants to pick this up. But uh, effectively, a lot of the questions were related to how to address cybersecurity issues. And I know that we've discussed, for example, some of the gaps in the toolkit and not tying it between some of the technical aspects and the social aspects. Um, but perhaps throwing that out there is a question to the panelists if they see a, a opportunity with a toolkit as it exists today to think about cybersecurity, or if that is one of the gaps, how could we address that gap in terms of factoring in security issues in the analysis? Uh, I'll see if someone wants to try to uh, respond to that. And I'm um, looking at Wei might be interested as he was nodding along. Um, but 
putting it out there to see if any of our panelists wants to give it a go. If I may jump in again. So I, I really don't see a direct connection from, from security and the, 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 this basic uh, five uh, basic uh, principles. So uh, this is something I mentioned before. So uh, maybe it's a kind of use cases we can develop uh, trying uh, to, to, to build this relationship between those basic architectural features that are reflected by the five uh, critical properties and other features we want to see at the internet, such as security or trustworthiness. Because if we, we remember, uh, security was not one of the main architectural features uh, by the fathers of the internet when the internet was conceived uh, 45, 50 years ago. So it's something that has been uh, brought afterwards in different ways, uh, but not at the inf lev or level of the infrastructure. So uh, it's mostly something that we uh, are worried about at the application level uh, and the service level. So that's something really interesting to, to, to study. So if we can build a bridge between those five uh, critical properties and the other features, uh, these thing, things that uh, have been called here the social aspects of the internet. How can we bridge those those two different uh, worlds, and 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 see if there there's can be uh, some connection between the, the five critical properties and those other properties uh, that end users expect from from the internet. Thank you very much, Flavio, and and I think that is a good suggestion to put it on the list on on things that should be added in the follow up work on this how do we map cybersecurity and security issues to these critical properties what is the, their role um we we've approached we're we're a bit over time and i greatly appreciate that people stayed on and and joined this q and a afterwards um ashley i don't know if you had a final slide just for uh for the yes exactly how to get involved um so what we're doing in 2021 is we, we want to progress this work together with the community and progress it along the lines that have been raised today. For example, the gaps in the toolkit. How do you map social issues back to these technical properties? How can we expand and figure out lenses for connecting the dots between cybersecurity and these critical properties? Uh, how can it be deployed in different environments to study different use cases, for example, different topics or different um cases that might be relevant in your local context let's say that there is a new intermediary liability law coming out a case study around that so we're looking to have uh, a lot of community involvement in 2021 uh, to both help develop and, and expand the toolkit in terms of uses and, and case studies and also these additional lenses right like the things that this toolkit doesn't capture now um, and we're hoping to also expand training opportunities to this. Uh, you know, Alexandra is, is starting the, the sort of educational aspects and connecting this to an academic environment. How can we learn from such initiatives, for example, in helping training our broader community? Um, so we encourage you to be involved if you are interested. Right now, we're just sort of collecting interest. Uh, the work would start in 2021, but right now we're just collecting interested parties that would be sort of joining the journey in, in 2021. So if you are interested in being a, a closer part in this uh, work, please send an email to uh, Katie or myself uh, and yeah, flag that and we will reconnect in early 2021 with those who that have expressed interest. So thank you very much for, for joining today. Uh, greatly appreciate the input from our presenters. Big thank you for joining and presenting your work. Greatly appreciated it. And uh, thank you very much for today. Um, Evelyn, do you have any final words? Yeah, no, I just really want to thank everyone for staying on uh, until this time. We really appreciate your time. And uh, we've noted all the questions that were unanswered. Uh, we'll get back to the project leads and uh, get those responses and we'll send them back to you. So thank you so much. We'll also send a post-production um, uh, 
uh, recording that will be sent through the uh, email that you receive after the call. So you receive that from us. Thanks again for the session and uh, we wish you the very best of your day. Thanks everyone. Cheers. <laughs>